This video is supported by Brilliant. Hey there, kiddos. Gather around and let me tell you the story of Old Rip. Old Rip was a horny toad, or as my lawyers have informed me to call it, a horned frog. Horn frogs are these flat little lizards you find around here in all these parts. They got spikes all over them and horns on their heads. They're ornery as all get out, but they're cute. Kids love to catch them and try to keep them as pets. Hell, Texans love them so much, we named them the State Lizard. Well, in 1897 in Eastland, Texas, they was building them a new courthouse, and they thought it might be a good idea to put a time capsule in the wall so the people from the future could learn something about it. So a fellow named Ernest Wood gathered up some documents and a newspaper and a Bible, and last but not least, a live horned frog. And he sealed that up in a time capsule and they put that... Wait, hold on a second, wait. A live horned frog? They put a live animal in a time capsule. What the frog? So yeah, they sealed a live horny toad in a time capsule and they bricked it into the keystone of this courthouse. And I don't know how long they were supposed to leave it there, what time they were supposed to open it up, but about 30 years later, they were doing some construction on the courthouse. They were putting an addition on there and yeah, they had to take the time capsule out. So they opened the box and what they found inside was, you know, some documents and a newspaper and a Bible and, of course, a dead horn frog. Or so they thought. Yeah, in a matter of seconds, after opening the box, the horn frog's legs started to kick and it just woke up and went about trying to find some ants to eat. This horn frog was named Old Rip after Rip Van Winkle and it immediately became famous. It was adopted as a, as a town hero. It actually went through a legal custody dispute for a while. It actually got to meet President Coolidge. And then after all the hubbub, Old Rip lived for another year before he passed away. And yeah, they put him on display at the Eastland Courthouse. You can go there right now and see it yourself. So growing up here in Texas, I knew all about Old Rip. I actually have some family that live out near Eastland. It's definitely a big part of like local Texas lore and everything, but I was always fascinated with it growing up. The idea that, you know, a frog could just sleep for 30 years. As I got older, I became more skeptical. Obviously, I've become more skeptical about most things, but uh, as it turns out, Old Rip is not alone. There's actually a lot of stories out there about frogs and lizards that have been found in rocks. It's happened so much that the phenomenon actually has a name, entombed animals. So have you ever been up late at night in some random memory from your childhood popped into your brain and then you got on the internet and started searching around and you just fall down a rabbit hole of crazy. That's how this video got started. No, I was procrastinating getting some work done one day and yeah, the, the memory of old Rip popped in my head and I was like, what was that all about? So I get on the internet and I start looking around and I just find story after story after story after story that are just like this. And uh, yeah, I, here we are. And yeah, I know you're skeptical about this, I know it already, but let me just let me just go down the list here. In 1719, the French Academy of Sciences had a report of a thick tree that when felled contained a quote, a live toad, middle-sized but lean and filling up the entire vacant space. In 1733, in Wanlingabo, Sweden, two quarry workers reported that they split a block of sandstone and inside the boulder, they found a frog covered with a yellow membrane. The rock was from the Silurian Hamra formation and believed to be 410 million years old. In 1770, a live toad was found in the wall of a castle that was being demolished. In 1818, a mineralogist named E.D. Clark claimed that he found three salamanders in an old rock. In 1821, a stonemason named David Vircher claimed to find a lizard in a solid block of limestone and that it took some time to revive, but it eventually did come back to life. In 1825, a professor named William Buckland decided to actually test this phenomenon, so he sealed up 24 toads in a block of limestone and 24 in sandstone and buried them for a year. Frog genocide for science. So yeah, when he dug them up, he found that some of them had survived, but he had also found some cracks in the blocks that, you know, um, something might have gotten in there, air, water, maybe. Anyway, he sealed them all up and they all died. In 1856, two London rail workers were digging a new tunnel and claimed that they found a boulder and opened it up and a pterodactyl flew out, but immediately died and turned to dust. That one may have been a lie. In the early 1900s in Devonshire, England, a gas fitter named Eric G. Mackley claimed to find 23 frogs encased in the concrete walls of a home, saying, quote, The meter houses were brick-walled but rather massively concrete-floored, and the concrete had to be broken up to allow me to get to the pipes for the extension. My mate was at work with a sledgehammer when he dropped it and suddenly said, That looks like a frog's leg. We both bent down and there was the frog. The sledge was set aside and I cut the rest of the block carefully. We released 23 perfectly formed but minute frogs which all hopped away into the flower garden. 
1943, a British soldier stationed in Algeria was quarrying stone for a road construction, and he found both a toad and a lizard living inside a rock that had been dug out from 20 feet below the ground. Even Benjamin Franklin claimed to have studied a pair of frogs that had been cut out of a limestone boulder in Paris in 1782. Now, let's get real for a second. Yes, a lot of these could have been mistaken. It's very possible that there was a crevice in the rock or the boulder that the, you know, the frog or the lizard had gotten into, and then when it cracked open, it looked like they were in the middle of the thing. That's possible. And it's also possible they were just, you know, around the rocks and trees, and then when they split open, it just kind of looked like they were in there. And this does kind of have the makings of a fad. It seemed to be something that was reported a lot back then. You know, fads are nothing new. We didn't create those. And like the pterodactyl story, some of them were probably just made up. But maybe, maybe some of them are true. I mean, after all, the animal kingdom has adopted some amazing survival abilities over the years. So for example, one way to survive your environment is just to get out of that environment by hibernating. So we're all familiar with the idea of hibernation. Uh, you're probably thinking of bears that stuff themselves in the fall and then find a cave in the winter and just sleep it off to the whole thing. But of course, it's, it's more complicated than that. See, so yeah, hibernation is a term for an animal that lives off of its fat stores throughout the winter, um, the bear thing, for example. But there's another form of hibernation that's more specific to animals in dry environments called estivation. And this is where they actually slow their metabolic rate down to near death in order to survive. This is kind of nuts, actually, because it's, it's like a gray area between life and death. Like, the metabolism slows down so much that it's technically not alive, but it's not quite dead, either. It's like, you know, nature hits the pause button on it. One animal that's the champion of this is the wood frog. There's nothing that special about the wood frog for most of the year, but as winter starts to approach, it does something interesting. It stops peeing. Yeah, it just lets the pee build up inside of itself, and at the same time, the liver starts creating large amounts of glycogen, which gets converted into glucose. And so the pee and the glucose gets mixed up in its blood and creates sort of an antifreeze, and this makes it so that the frog can have 65% of its body freeze completely solid and survive. It doesn't breathe, it has zero synaptic brain activity, it's in a state known as cryptobiosis. And then in the spring it thaws out, starts hopping around just like nothing ever happened. Now theoretically, if it stayed in that unthawed state, it could probably stay that way for years. Decades even? And by the way, it's not just lizards and, and cold-blooded creatures. The arctic ground squirrel can actually lower its body temperature to negative three degrees Celsius. And it can stay in that state for up to eight months of the year. It slows its heart rate down to just like a couple beats a minute. It's one of the most extreme hibernators in the world. I mean, even humans can survive freezing to a surprising level. In 2015, a kid named John Smith, apparently that's his actual name, survived being underwater and frozen for 15 minutes, and his breathing had stopped for over an hour before they finally brought him back to life, and he survived just fine. And there are other animals that have developed protections against the cold, like Greenland shark and the Antarctic toothfish that both have antifreeze in their blood in the form of ammonia and glycoproteins. Crocodiles have protection against both the heat and the cold. If it gets too hot, they can go into an estivation state where they can go three to four years without food. And if it gets too cold, they can do a wood frog thing and just allow themselves to freeze with their snouts above the frozen water so they can breathe. And then there's the lungfish, which, as the name implies, has evolved lungs so they can breathe outside the water. They can ride out droughts by burrowing into the ground and making a little nest there. It coats itself in mucus that kind of dries into a leathery bag of sorts and then just waits it out. Its bodily functions come to a virtual standstill and it feeds off of its own muscle, basically consuming itself in very slow motion. And it can do this for up to five years. And when the rains come back, they reanimate, go on with their lives like nothing ever happened. But of course, if you want to get into some real extreme files, you gotta go a lot smaller. And one of the most notable ones is one that was actually kind of a popular pet for a long time. Remember sea monkeys? Because I'm just ancient enough to remember it. Sea monkeys were a popular toy slash educational tool that were around and sold through comic books in the 60s and 70s. And yeah, it was this toy where the kids would buy these kits and they would pour water into it and add these like magic crystals and then boom, out of nowhere would be these little swimmy things. Of course, they were not monkeys of any kind. They were actually a type of brine fish that had been sort of genetically altered through selective breeding so that they could only survive in this particular solution that they sold along with it. The whole story's kind of crazy, but brine shrimp are crazy uh, in and of themselves because they also have a, a very extreme form of cryptobiosis. Yet when they dry out, they enter this form of suspended animation and basically can stay that way indefinitely until they're rehydrated and then they reanimate again. 
And this is basically how they became a thing, their ability to kind of dry themselves out and survive that way long enough so that they could ship these sea monkey kits all around the world. And it was also kind of almost like a magic trick for kids. You know, you pour it in there and then just like watch these things come to life. But they're fascinating creatures and they're really tough. They actually did experiments on them in two Apollo missions. So brain shrimp are cool, but it's in the microscopic world where you find the real extreme survivors. Enter the Permian bacteria. Now we started this whole journey talking about things being found alive in rocks. This one takes the cake. The Permian bacteria were found in a cavern near Carlsbad, New Mexico, and they were found deposited on some salt crystals that were embedded in a rock. And now the reason why they're called the Permian bacteria is because that particular rock dated back to the Permian era. And if you don't have a geological calendar in front of you, the Permian era was 250 million years ago. And they came back to life. Now, it does need to be said that this is hotly disputed, just like some of those toad stories. Some people say it might be possible that there was a tiny fissure in the rock that allowed that bacteria to get in there, so it's actually from a more modern origin, all that stuff. But there was a study in 2006 that um, analyzed the DNA and the fatty acids in this bacteria and determined that it is different enough from modern bacteria that it seems to be legit. Other studies have suggested that it's not different enough from modern bacteria to actually be that old, so the debate continues. Science gonna science. But last but not least, you can't talk about amazing animal survivors without talking about the Superman of the microbiological world, tardigrades. Yeah, some of you knew this was coming, I know. Yeah, there's a ton of videos that have been done on tardigrades. I'll link to some of them down in the description if you wanna check them out. But let's just go down some of the crazier facts about tardigrades, shall we? They can live up to 10 years without food. They can remove all water from their bodies and survive. Their metabolism can drop to 0.01% of normal. They can survive the vacuum of space and the radiation of space. They can survive radiation in general by swapping out their water with sugar to prevent ionization. They can survive temperatures as high as 7 degrees Celsius, that's 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And when they enter cryptobiosis, they enter a state called a ton. And this makes them virtually indestructible. Pretty much if whatever is keeping them alive begins to cease, they have a way around it. Tardigrades are so hardy and impossible to kill that some people have actually speculated that they came here on a meteorite, that they're actually like an alien species, panspermia, if you will. Now that's not true. They have sequenced the genome of the tardigrade and have been able to determine that they are similar enough to animals from planet Earth, that they didn't come from somewhere else, but they might be the first Earth creature to colonize other worlds. The Beresheet lander that crashed on the moon in 2017 had some sample tardigrades on it to do some experiments on the moon. So there are tardigrades on the moon right now, and they're probably doing fine. We do know that they can survive the vacuum and radiation of space because ESA did an experiment back in 2007 with some tardigrades where they were totally exposed to space and cosmic rays and everything, and uh, yeah, it did nothing. If you've heard of the Breakthrough Starshot program, the idea of actually putting little tiny light sails that can ride a beam of laser light to a nearby star, there are plans and talks of actually putting tardigrades on one, just because, I guess. So yeah, frogs and rocks. <laughs> Yay or nay, what do you think? Was old Rip just an old fraud? Now, I didn't mention this before, but when they actually found Old Rip in the time capsule, it wasn't just some guy that got it out and went around telling everybody that he found this frog. It was actually part of a little event. They made a little event out of opening up this time capsule. So when they pulled this frog out, it came to life in front of many people. So on one hand, that kind of makes you think maybe it was real, but then you might also say, who knows, they could have switched it out beforehand and it was all just a big publicity stunt. And if that's the case, well, it worked. But still, it's a fun piece of Texas lore and, uh, you know, a good jumping off point to looking at the way nature has come up with survival abilities over the last billion years or so. And who knows, maybe there's something we can learn from these species that we can use in some medical advances. Ways to boost our own survival, possibly. Because ultimately, life is just a series of chemical reactions and survival is just finding ways to keep those chemical reactions going. So if you'd like to learn more about chemical reactions and how they make life possible, you might want to check out the chemical reactions course on Brilliant. I don't know, that was a good segue. They don't have a course on rock toads. In this course, you'll learn the fundamentals of chemistry by learning how reactions occur, and you'll do it through 15 interactive quizzes and puzzles to see how change, energy, and probability combine to determine the basic behavior of molecules interacting with other molecules. 
You'll get a handle on acids and bases, ions and charge, moles and collision theory, and much more. And you'll do it in a way that's much more fun than high school chemistry class, which I practically needed a pillow to sleep through. And of course, this is just one of dozens of courses on Brilliant, where you can learn everything from algebra and calculus, which was also nap time for me in high school, to astronomy, solar energy, basic physics, all the way up to neural nets and statistical probability. You can go as basic or as advanced as you want, and it's a lot of fun. Viewers of this channel can sign up at brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe and get access to their free weekly puzzles and brain teasers. You can kind of test them out, see how much you like it. And if you do like it, the first 200 people that sign up for the premium subscription gives you access to all their different courses. You can get 20% off your subscription. So yeah, it's starting to look like this pandemic isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So if you want to take this opportunity to get a little bit smarter while you're sheltering in place and whatnot, Brilliant's a great way to do that. So again, brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe. Go check it out. Big thanks to Brilliant for being awesome supporters of this channel and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are forming a community, helping me grow a team. I can't say enough good things about them. I got a few people I need to shout out real quick. We got Stanley Adams, Stephen Norris, Sigmund Ross Wilson, Knuckleburger, <laughs> Nick Cap, uh, Beth Guncianis, Dylan Shippey, and Skylar Shark. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, access to me, exclusive live streams, and other stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash store. It's not just t-shirts, it's mugs, branded and otherwise. Anything that you see on a shirt that you might like, you can get it on a mug, hoodies, posters, all kinds of stuff. It supports the channel, supports a great designer in Prague. Again, answerswithjoe.com slash store. Go check it out. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google says to watch this. Don't let Google down. You might like it. And if you do like it, maybe check out some of the other videos. If you enjoy what I do, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.